Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless your name because you've led us thus far in this Congress. We thank you because of the decision and dedication of every heart to seek you and to find you. And we are praying, O oh Lord, that this decision will be confirmed by your power and enablement in Jesus' name. As we come to this important subject of prayer that we need to address now, Lord, we pray that you grant us the help of the Spirit to reveal the truth about the prayer, the prayer life of a child of God, of a minister of the gospel, the way it ought to be. And Lord, we pray that you enlighten us on how to pray, what to pray for, so that we will be an instrument in your hand, able to turn things around by the very power and privilege of praying. Open our eyes of understanding that you will take the simple, basic truth of Scripture on prayer and make out deep revelation for every one of us so that our prayer lives will never be the same again. We believe you have answered. We believe we are not going to remain the same. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you look at the program page, you will see that the second message every morning follows a series. It's under the theme, Christ's Prayer Model. And under this prayer model given by the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll be looking at four topics. The first one, which by the grace of God we're dealing with this morning, is a pattern of prayer. Tomorrow, as the Lord gives us the opportunity, we'll be dealing with the priority of prayer. The day following, petitions in prayer. And the last in the series is preservation through prayer. I believe that the Lord has a lot to reveal concerning prayer, especially as we look at the model prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught his own disciples. And I believe that this is something no believer, no minister in particular will want to miss. The subject of prayer is very vital to the life of the believer. Not only that, it is vital to the ministry of the minister. As you know, the Word of God, the New Testament, enjoins us to pray without ceasing. That is, start praying, keep on praying, never stop praying. And if, it's, if something is so essential, so important, so consuming in Scripture, that we are told to keep on doing it without stopping, it must be very important for us to know how to do it aright. And yet we know that the same New Testament tells us that we do not know how to pray or what to pray for as we ought. This is something we need to do continually, always. We need to do evermore, without ceasing. And yet, that same Bible telling us that we ought to pray unceasingly, perseveringly, until we prevail in prayer. That same Bible tells us we do not know how to pray as we ought to pray. Which means then, seeing the centrality that God himself places prayer in, in the life of the believer, as well as in the ministry of the minister. And knowing that we do not know how to do it the way we ought to do it. Understand that passage that says, we do not know how to pray, what to pray for, and how to pray for the things that we need to pray for. The passage that tells us that we do not know how to do it is after the life of Christ, after the cross, after Pentecost, after the establishment of the church. Well then, 
if such a statement appears after the life of Christ on earth, after the cross, after Pentecost, after the establishment of the church, it must be a very serious thing that a believer will come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need to learn. And I sensed the leading of the Spirit of God that this time as we come together for the Congress, that I will deal with this series on praying, believing that by the end of the series, God will have revealed to you and to me how to really pray. And our lives will never be the same again. And our ministries will never be the same again. Prayer has always been central to the lives of the people of God in every age. In Scripture, we have the call to pray, the commandment to pray, the encouragement to pray. In Scripture, we also have the promises of God, that God will answer prayer. If such is our privilege, if such are the promises, then prayer should not be an emergency appeal that we just come before the throne of God at an emergency time. But it should be an unbroken communion and fellowship with the Lord. And uh, the prayer model we're going to examine is a prayer model that I believe is very familiar to everyone here. So familiar that many people do not know the meaning. Many people do not know the significance. Many people do not know the depth of revelation we have in the prayer that Jesus taught. The prayer model is recorded in two different passages. One, in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus Christ had been talking about the life of the kingdom. Matthew is the special gospel given to the kingdom. And Jesus Christ, within the message of the king, the manifesto of the king, the thing that tells us the address of the king, so special, so deep, the Sermon on the Mount, has been talking about the life of the believer from Matthew chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, he begins to talk about the religious or the Christian activities of the citizens of the kingdom. And he says, the citizens of the kingdom will need to give, they will need to pray, they will need to fast. And in talking about those three activities of kingdom citizens, he pointed out that the Pharisees, the religious rulers and leaders of the day, they had missed God, the plan of God, and they had missed the way they ought to do things on those three levels. Their giving was wrong. Their fasting was wrong. Their praying was wrong. Concerning giving, the Lord said, this is how the Pharisees had been doing it. That is not how to do it. This is the way to do it. Concerning fasting, he told the hearers, he said, this is the way they have been doing it. They ought not to do it that way. This is the way to do it. Concerning praying, he said, this is the way they have been doing it. They ought not to do it that way. This is the way to do it. And then he gave a model, which we'll look at very soon. The second occasion when this model is found in Scripture is Luke chapter 11. On this occasion, the disciples had been watching the Lord pray. And he saw that everything in his life depended upon prayer. He said, the Father that sent me is with me. He said, the work I do, I'm not the one doing it, it's the Father working in me. And then they saw him early in the morning. He will go to a solitary place and he will pray. Not only that, he prayed for the impossible or the incredible, for the unthinkable. For example, Lazarus had been dead four days, and he came to the grave of Lazarus. And again, he prayed to the Father. 
what many people will not even think or praying about. Jesus prayed about them. And the disciples saw the effect, the power, and the result of praying in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. This was the thing that forced them, moved one of them to come to the Lord to say, Lord, this is so important. This is so essential. This is so central in your life. If you, the very Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, if you, the incarnate Son of God, will need to pray very much, we need to pray more. And yet, we do not know how to do it the way you are doing it. And so they told him in Luke chapter 11 verse 1, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, when he stopped, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. I'm sure you know that some of the disciples of Jesus Christ were originally with John the Baptist. In fact, it was one day that John the Baptist saw Jesus Christ coming. And he pointed to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When he said that, two of his disciples overheard. And he followed after the Lord Jesus. And he said, Lord, where do you live? And he said, Come and see. They followed him. And he never got back to John anymore. They became disciples of Jesus Christ. Just a day with the Lord you'll never be the same again. They couldn't go back to the old master anymore. And they already knew the pattern of prayer that John the Baptist taught them. But now they came to Christ. They saw that prayer was different. Prayer accomplished something different and something of greater magnitude. And so they said, John taught us, we still have the format, we still have the wordings, of what John taught, but we'll rather listen to you. You see, that is the attitude we ought to have. You might think you know how to pray, because you've been in a particular place before, where you did not know the fullness of revelation concerning Jesus Christ. But now, after you have come to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you bring all the prayer pattern you knew before, you bring that into your new Christian life. That's not right. If you have left John the Baptist, then leave that other prayer pattern and come to the Lord and say, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. On this occasion, what did he give them? This same model. Let's look at the model in Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. And I'm reading to you from verse 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the prayer. In the Greek version, that's the New Testament, this prayer is just about 66 words. Very brief, very short. And it's only the Son of God, Jesus Christ, that could compress so much into prayer. You have it, very simple, very short, and yet, would you be surprised that all these four sessions we're going to have at the Congress on the prayer model, I'll be staying with just this prayer. People call it the Lord's Prayer. Others refer to it as the Disciples' Prayer because he gave it into their hands. He said, this is the model this is a pattern. This is how to pray. 
And as we look at this, there is so much in here. But let's first of all clear up some attitudes and some activities of people with the prayer. Did Jesus mean that every time we pray, all we need to do is to recite this prayer? Did he mean that all we're to do is to just take this prayer at the end of all the other things we say whenever we're going to pray in worship or the study or the revival? Just do all your normal praying and at the end of it say, Our Father which art in heaven, and then go through the whole thing without thinking. No, not at all. Why do we know that he does not want us to just repeat this? There are three reasons I can give you. Number one, he had just said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, you should not have, you should not use vain repetition. And since he said we shouldn't use vain repetition, he couldn't then immediately, two verses after that, give you something you repeat every day of your life. It's not for repetition. Number two, the reason why we know we're not to repeat, just to recite the prayer. The disciples came in Luke and they didn't say, teach us a prayer. They said, teach us how to pray. And he was teaching them not a prayer that they were to recite every time. He was teaching them how to pray. Number three, there is no occasion in the New Testament. There is no occasion in the early church in the New Testament record where anyone or the church used the prayer, go through Acts of the Apostles. They prayed in Acts chapter 1. They prayed in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 3, they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. In Acts chapter 4, after they had been persecuted, they came together. They raised their voice to the Lord and they prayed. In Acts chapter 5, they prayed. Acts chapter 6, we're going to commit ourselves to the praying and to the ministry of the world. You find prayer going through all of Acts. And yet, you do not find a single example, a single situation where this prayer was repeated. What then are we to do with the prayer? We are to look at this as a model, as a pattern, which will dictate, which will determine, which will help us in all our areas and life of praying. And that's what we're going to do. Today, I'm taking the subject, pattern of prayer. The pattern of prayer. There are three points we're going to consider. Number one, general observations in Christ's model prayer. Just observations in the prayer. Number two, the fatherhood of God. You will see that Jesus always prayed to the Father. Those who have studied the New Testament extensively, they tell us that about 70 times, when the Lord prayed, he addressed God as Father in prayer. You go on to the epistles, you also find, I bow my knee unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you will ask the Father anything in my name, I will do it. And so we have the fatherhood of God in prayer. Number three, honor and reverence for God's name. Honor and reverence for God's name. There's power in that name, protection in that name, refuge in that name, authority in that name. And you need to honor, reverence that name. Now, as we look at this prayer model, what do we see? Let me point out under subtitle number one, general observations in Christ's prayer model. I want to point out three things. Number one, relationship. Number two, attitude. Number three, focus. Number one, relationship. As you look at this prayer that Jesus taught the disciples, what do you see? Number one, you see relationship between the person praying and the God he is praying to. Actually, you cannot make any prayer, you cannot do any praying without a firm relationship with the Lord. And the Lord masterfully shows us the relationship that ought to be between us and the Lord if we are praying. And if you really want to get your prayers answered, these are things you need to take note of and say, do I have that relationship with the Lord? Do I have that relationship with the Lord? Look at this. Our Father which art in heaven. That is father-child relationship. At the very beginning of the prayer, he tells us what gives us the privilege of prayer, 
What makes me to be able to go to those promises that were written before I was born? What makes me to be able to lay hold on those promises and say, this promise is mine because there is a father-child relationship. Hallowed be thy name. That is deity worshiper relationship. You see, this is the relationship of a person that has come to the Lord and he recognizes that God is a sovereign, supreme one to worship. And he says, hallowed be thy name. It's coming from the background of the children of Israel, not to make mention of the name of any idol, any other God. And he comes to the Lord and he says, Lord, I'm your child. You are my father. And I maintain this relationship, father-child relationship, not, that, not only that, number two, a deity worshiper relationship. Then thy kingdom come. That is a sovereign subject relationship. When a person comes and he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Sorry, thy kingdom come. He means that he understands there is a sovereign, there is a God. There is somebody that controls the whole universe and the kingdom actually eventually belongs to him and he maintains this relationship of sovereign subject relationship. It means that you have entered into the kingdom. How could you so appreciate the kingdom, embrace the kingdom, desire the kingdom until you literally pray thy kingdom come except you are the kingdom subject. It is the sovereign subject relationship. Thy will be done in us as it is in heaven. That is master servant relationship. It means all my life I own you as Lord, as master. No more Satan's will in my life. I was held captive to the will of the devil before I knew the Lord. No more uh, doing the will of self. Self-will was a singular pronounced thing in my life before I knew the Lord. But now, not my will, not Satan's will, not even man's will, but thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. It is the master-servant relationship. And then it goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. That is the benefactor-beneficiary relationship. It means you have the Lord to depend upon. And you know that there may be drought or famine in the whole world, but the creator of the heavens and the earth is the almighty benefactor. And what a wonderful thing for you and for me, that we are beneficiaries of the inexhaustible benefactor of heaven. And so we come every time I will say, give us this day our daily bread. And then forgive us, forgive us. What's that? Savior, sinner relationship. It is an acknowledgement of the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if we're going to have the middle wall of partition broken down between us and the Lord, we need a Savior. And this is maintaining a savior sinner relationship. And then it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is an acknowledgement. I am blind. I need to be led. I do not know the way. I need to be led. Every day I come to a crossroad. I need to be led. What kind of relationship is that? A guide pilgrim relationship. That means I'm a pilgrim on my way to the heavenly city, the better country, and I'm seeking to be led by the Lord. There is a guide, pilgrim relationship. How many people pray without having relationship with the Lord? How many people pray and they do not even know the various manifold uh, types of relationship we ought to have with the Lord? A father-child relationship, a deity worshiper relationship, a sovereign subject relationship, a master-servant relationship, a benefactor-beneficiary relationship, not only that savior-sinner relationship, and a guide-pilgrim relationship. Look at this prayer again. And now look at the attitude with which we pray. Because, you see, if we're going to pray and pray right, the attitude, the spirit in which we pray is very, very important. How many people do not actually know how well to pray 
and they come before the Lord with an attitude of pride. And the Bible says that God looks at the proud far away, but the humble he will condescend to, and he will bless them. And so Jesus Christ, knowing the might of the Father, and knowing exactly how to pray, the spirit with which to pray, the attitude with which to pray, he gives us this in the prayer. Look at it once again, our. That is a kind of attitude that is unselfish. You see, there are many people that pray, and you can see the personal pronouns in their prayer. It is all the time, I, me, and mine. But here is our Father. And then Father, that is a family spirit. That is what gives confidence to a child of God. Because he comes not as a slave. He comes as a child of God. And he comes in that family attitude and family spirit. Hallowed be thy name. That is a reverent spirit. An adoring spirit. He comes, he doesn't just rush into the presence of God and then say, God, do this, do this, do this, without any honor, reverence, or respect, or adoration. But he has a reverent spirit. Thy kingdom come, that's a loyal spirit. Oh Lord, I'm part of your kingdom. The kingdom is in my heart already. Because the kingdom is within you. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, joy, peace in the Holy Ghost. And that kingdom already is here within me. And I'm expecting, O oh Lord, that the finality of the kingdom will eventually come. And while we're waiting for the, uh, for the manifestation of that kingdom, I will be a loyal individual in the kingdom, a loyal spirit. Thy will be done a submissive spirit. O oh Lord, this is what I want. But you know what's good for me? I will not impose my will on the Almighty who am I. Thy will be done a submissive spirit. Give us this day our daily bread. That's a dependent spirit. O oh Lord, where could I be without you? What could I have without you? What could I enjoy without you? A dependent spirit. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That is a penitent spirit, a repentant spirit. You check up your life. If there is anything that is wrong, you want to get rid of it. You want to settle it by the blood of the Lamb. Not only that, it goes on to say, lead us not into temptation. A humble spirit. This is a fellow that comes to the Lord and he doesn't come with overconfidence saying, I am saved and I know I'm saved forever. I am saved and I know I can handle any situation. I am saved and there's no temptation that I worry about. I am saved and I know that whatever comes, I'm knowledgeable enough, I'm, I'm great enough, I'm mighty enough to handle it. No, lead us not into temptation. It is a humble spirit. Thine is the kingdom. It comes to a confident spirit. Or oh, it says, whatever the kingdoms of the world have done, Egypt has come and gone. Assyria has come and gone. Greece has come and gone. And the Roman Empire kingdom has come and gone. And the contemporary kingdoms of the world, now, they are there now, but they will soon go. Thine is the kingdom. So then, whatever wind may be blowing, we have confidence in the Lord when we pray. It is a confident spirit and the power that's a triumphant spirit. We know uh, the, uh, the final thing is not in the hands of Satan. The final outcome of the battle is not in the hands of the people of the world. Thine is the power. It is a triumphant spirit and the glory forever. That is an exultant spirit. You just come before the Lord. You start with an unselfish spirit. You go on to a family spirit. It's with a reverent spirit you pray. It's with loyal spirit you are praying. It's with a submissive attitude. You are talking to the Lord and you are dependent and penitent. Not only that, you are humble. But then with that humility, with that submission, comes confidence in God. Comes triumph of truth over error. Triumph of righteousness over sin. Triumph of the God of heaven over anything that has raised its ugly head against the plan of the Lord from the beginning of creation. You come with a confident, triumphant, exultant spirit. And if you come like that to pray, you will enjoy the prayer. You will know the God you are praying to. 
you will know that God will answer. There will be no doubt because you will know that all power resides in the Almighty. Now look at this prayer another way. As you look at this prayer that Jesus taught the disciples and the Lord is teaching us, you will see the focus on God. You will see that it exalts God. It talks about the kingdom of God. It talks about the will of God. And it talks about the finality, the preeminence, always coming back to the almighty God. Look over it once again. Our Father which art in heaven, that is God's paternity. You see, when we talk of maternity, we're talking on the area of the mother. When we talk of paternity, we're talking of the area of the father, his father. Our Father which art in heaven. It's unfortunate that the Church of England and uh, the Anglican Church overseas are trying to introduce the motherhood rather than the fatherhood of God. And they are tending towards a Catholicism. But here Jesus Christ, when he taught the disciples to pray, he taught about God's paternity. And he says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is God's priority. He wants that name to be exalted. He wants the name to be known. And everywhere, wherever there is son, he wants his name to be recognized that he is the all in all. Hallowed be thy name is God's priority. Thy kingdom come is God's program. Do you know that's the program of God? From the Old Testament time, you'll see from the time that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Daniel explained that dream to him. And he said, you have your kingdom now, but another kingdom will come. And that kingdom will never be destroyed. It will go on and on and on forever. And Daniel also was in the kingdom of Darius. And when Darius also was commenting in Daniel chapter 6, he talked about the kingdom of God. It will be forever and ever. And then when you come to the New Testament and John was talking about the kingdom, he, he was the forerunner of the king, the king of the kingdom. And again, he said, the kingdom is at hand. When Jesus came, he mentioned that kingdom again. You go on to Revelation until the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God has a program. And that program concerns the kingdom. Thy kingdom come tells us about God's program. Thy will be done. That's God's purpose and plan. In everything that God does, any time, any church age, any dispensation, he wants his will to be done. In fact, why did he create man? Why did he redeem man? Why did he establish the church? Why did he send Jesus Christ? It is so that as his will is being done in heaven, without question, wholeheartedly, completely, entirely, and without wavering, so that his will will be done on earth. It is God's purpose and plan. Give us this day our daily bread. That's God's provision. God's provision. Oh yes, he provides. He knows our need. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. By Christ Jesus, forgive us our debts. As we also forgive our debtors. That is God's pardon. Who is a pardoning God like him? Who will subdue our iniquity and put it in the depths of the sea, never to be remembered against us anymore? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is God's protection. Oh Lord, there is evil in the world. There is a devil in the world. Protect us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory that is God's preeminence. The prayer focuses on God, God's paternity, God's priority, God's program, God's purpose and plan, God's provision, God's pardon, God's protection, God's preeminence. If you know this, you'll be able to pray. If you understand the attitude we ought to have in prayer, you'll be able to pray. If you understand the focus in prayer, and your focus is on the glory of God and His glory alone, and you say, Lord, I'm asking for this, not just selfishly for myself, but that the Father, that God may be glorified. 
when the centrality of your prayer, the focus of, of your prayer, and the very purpose of your prayer, of your request, is so that God will be glorified. It will not take time. That prayer will be answered. Let's go to point number two. The fatherhood of God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. Let's stop there for a moment. You will see that the Lord, many, many times, most of the time, he prayed to the Father. And you will see that he taught the disciples to you that they will ask the Father in his name. And even the apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Ephesians, he said, I told you already, I bowed the knee unto the Father. And you know that every time we pray here, most of the time we say, we actually start with saying, Our Father. We might say, Almighty God, but before we end the prayer, we say, Our Father. Because that is the pattern the Lord has taught us to pray through or to pray in. You see, to the world and to the whole universe, God is simply creator, not father. If the word father is used on behalf or in connection with the people of the world or the whole universe, it's in the sense of a creator. He created the world. He created the universe. He created all the things you can see. And the people said, we're not ourselves. We are the clay. Thou art the potter. In that way, God is the creator of the whole earth. To the sinners in every nation, and in all ages, the Lord is judge. That's why you find uh, Abraham coming to the Lord and saying, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And therefore God maintains that position, that authority, that is judge all over the earth. And to the creatures on earth and angels in heaven, God is the most high God. That's what, I be, that's what um, Abraham heard. When he was coming back from battle, and Melchizedek was to give him something. And then he said, Blessed be the God most high. When you compare God with the creatures on earth, is God most high. But then, when you become a child of God, peculiarly, you are the one that the Father has given the Spirit crying within your heart, Abba, Father. He becomes our Father by redemption. He becomes our father because our sins are forgiven. He becomes our father because we're reconciled with him. He becomes our father because the middle wall of partition has been broken down. He becomes our father because there is a bridge, there is a link, Jesus Christ linking us to God that we are now the children and he is father. I'm sure you know that it's not everybody on earth that can claim God to be their father. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, from verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would have loved me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Now he came out plain, verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil. And it is the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and a father of it. So then we learn from that, that those who are still liars, those who are still sinners, those who are still under the captivity and the control and the influence of Satan, are not the children of God, and they cannot appropriately come before the Lord and say, Our Father which art in heaven, but only the people that have turned away from sin, the people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, 
and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It says there is a condition before he can receive you. It says you will come out from among them. The Lord was using Paul the Apostle to tell the Corinthians, saying that these Corinthians, if they wanted to maintain a father-child relationship with the Lord, they will have to come out of the practices of fellow Corinthians. Come out from among them and be separate. Live a separated life, a distinct life, a distinguished life, a life that is marked by obedience unto the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Idolatry will defile you and corrupt you. Immorality, fornication, adultery will defile you and corrupt you. Stealing and fraud will defile you and corrupt you. And all the pagan rituals and ceremonies will defile and corrupt, but touch not the unclean thing. Then it says, only then will I be your God. Only then will I receive you. Listen to verse 18. And will be a father unto you. It's not a father to everyone that is still enjoying sin. Everyone that is still practicing evil. Everyone that has not repented, that has not turned away from evil. But when you make up your mind, I'll be different. I'll turn away from the things of the world. I will turn away from sin. I will turn away from anything polluting, anything corrupting, anything defiling. And I will keep myself clean by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Then it says, I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We know then what it means to be children of God. Now, this being a father, the fatherhood of God, is that limited to the New Testament concept? Or do we have anything like it in the Old Testament? Of course we do. Not only that, was it limited in the Old Testament to Jewish people? Or were the Jewish people looking forward to the time when Gentiles that were not Jewish people, not part of uh, the Jewish, Jewish nation, will also be able to call God their father? Yes, the Old Testament tells us the time will come when even Gentiles like you and I will be able to refer to God as our father. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63, reading from verse 16. Doubtless thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Here you find the Gentiles talking. Because they said, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and though the children of Israel may not even acknowledge us, that's the language of the Gentile, the language of those who are pagans, the language of the people that were not part of the commonwealth of Israel, though Israel will not even acknowledge us, yet we know thou art our father. On what basis? Is it on the basis of creation? No, on the basis of redemption. Because here it talks about the redemption of the Lord. And so when you are redeemed, when your sins are taken away, when you become a child of God, when by the grace of God you can refer to the Lord as your Redeemer, and you know that you have been redeemed, and all those sins and pollutions of your life, they have been totally cleansed away, then you will know that He is your Father, and you are the redeemed of the Lord. And then, if that has happened to you, then will you be able to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How do we know he can do that? Because we know thine is the power. And the, and the dying is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Is it only for now? Is it only for this year? Is it only temporarily? No, forever. And I say, amen, so let it be. And so we know that this prayer is teaching us that we can be the redeemed of the Lord, and the Lord can be our Father. Sin separates from God, and makes the sinner to tremble before God as the great judge. It is repentance turning away from sin. 
confessing and forsaking sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ that makes you to be able to call him father because that gives you the privilege of sonship. Then is he our father. And there are many fathers on earth, but those fathers on earth are earthy, earthly, limited, lacking in resources. All of us here, we are fathers on earth, but there are things fathers on earth cannot do. They cannot forgive sin. They cannot give you a ticket to heaven. They cannot open the way for you to get into heaven. They cannot rescue you from the hand of Satan. They cannot pluck you out of the burning fires of hell. But our Father which art in heaven, much greater, much higher than all the fathers on earth, because although fathers on earth are limited, our Father who is in heaven is unlimited. He is divine, he is heavenly, he is eternal, he is infinite. Now, as a father, what does he do for his own children? This is a study on its own. When you consider God as a father, and you look at the Bible, and you see the scope, the extent of the things that the Bible says God will do as a father. There are many people that pray, a father which art in heaven, and, and they never think about it. What, as he said, he will do as a father? What are the marks the characteristics of a father. What is the provision of the father? What is the peculiar thing that the father does for the children? That is what makes the prayer beautiful. When you think in the Bible and you see the various things that he does as a father. So many, I cannot show you everything. Let me just point a few to you. In Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 13 and verse 14. Like as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remember that we are dust. You see, that is the peculiar relationship that he maintains with us. And a peculiar thing that he does. As a father, he pities his children. It's more than that. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. The things that he does as a father. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more shall our Father who is in heaven give good things, good gifts to them that ask him? Which means then, he also gives us good things. But then you link that up with Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to, do, how to give good things to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, to them that ask him? Do you know that as a father, he also provides to meet all our needs? Come back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And in verse 26, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Here is what the Father does. Yet your Father, Heavenly Father, feedeth them, and ye not much better than they. Verse 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your Heavenly Father knoweth, that ye have need of all these things. And so then, as a father, he gives and he provides. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, from verse 29. And not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very ears of your head are all numbered. You'll see that he protects us so much because we're precious to him. Like children are precious to their parents in Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 4. This passage reveals to us another thing. We're to expect him to do for us as a father. Chapter 3 and verse 4, Will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father? 
Thou art the guide of my youth. In the darkness, in the confusion, in the crossroads of this world, we need guidance. And when you can say, Our Father which art in heaven, you have the peculiar promise of the Lord that he will guide and direct you all through the vicissitudes and the circumstances and the difficulties of life. And so we can depend upon him as Father to guide us in our earthly decisions in line with the knowledge of his broad heavenly plan. Not only that, as a father, he promotes his children in Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Reading from verse 26 all through to verse 28. It shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and a rock of my salvation. You see that? Is your God is the rock of your salvation. You have given to yourself to the Lord by faith. And then you can refer to him as my father. Verse 27, also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. And so then, you will see that he maintains a covenant relationship with us. In the New Testament, the Father does something very peculiar. I mean, our Heavenly Father. He reveals Christ the Lord, Christ the Savior, Christ the Son. He reveals him unto the people of God. In Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, reading to you from verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit, and he said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. He says he was praying to the Father, praying to the God of heaven. And here he was saying he thanked the Lord, but he referred to him peculiarly as Father. He says, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid those things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto the babes. Those are children, those are the people that have come into family relationship. And of course, you know that he blesses. He answers prayer. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have ordained you that you will go and bring forth fruit, and that your food shall remain. Notice what follows. And that whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Do you remember in James chapter 1, it says, All good gifts and perfect gifts, they come from the Father of lies, from with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Which means then, it is as a Father. He blesses us with all spiritual blessings, and He gives us every good gift and perfect gift. Are you praying to God as Father? Recognize then, as a Father, He pities His children. As a father, he gives good things to his children. As a father, he has mercy on his children. As a father, he gives the Holy Spirit to the children that ask him. As a father, he provides for need. As a father, he counts all the heirs, he numbers all the heirs on our head. And he protects us adequately and completely. As a father, he cares for us. As a father, he guides us in the decisions of life. As a father, he promotes. As a father, he keeps his covenant. As a, as a father, he reveals heaven. He reveals resources of heaven. He reveals Christ unto his own. As a father is very intimate with his children. Remember Jesus said, They that love me, I and my father will come unto them and will make our abode in them. As a father, he answers prayer. As a father, nothing good will he ever withdraw or withhold from his own. When you pray to God as a father, there is no fear. You come before the Lord. You approach him as father. And during this congress, I want to appeal to you. Come to the Lord boldly. With reverence, but boldly. Come to the Lord with assurance and confidence. Come to the Lord remembering the promises of the Lord. Come to the Lord understanding that if you ask the father anything in the name of the only begotten son, Jesus Christ, he will do them. And let us understand that he has all the resources in heaven to be able to meet all our needs. And he puts all those things in our disposal. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 6. 
Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When it says, hallowed be thy name, the Greek word there is uh, means, holy be thy name. It's talking about the name of God being so sacred and being so set apart that you hold the matchless name of God in reverence. To hallow the name of the Lord is to honor that name. It is to esteem that name. It is to reverence that name. It is to adore that name as divine and infinitely blessed. The only true God to hallow the name of the Lord is to so respect the name of the Lord that you will not blaspheme the name of the Lord. You will not take the name of the Lord in vain. You will exalt the name. You will hold the name of the Lord high. And you will believe the name of the Lord. And you will believe all the composite attributes belonging to that name. When you know the name of the Lord, prayer becomes enjoyable. When you approach the Lord, you approach him this way and you mention a particular name and that name is describing a particular characteristic of the Lord. And then you approach him another way, then you mention another name talking about the characteristic and the peculiarity and the attribute of the Lord. It makes prayer to come to a, very, a level where nothing can hinder your prayer. How could you hallow the name if you don't know that name? How could you honor the name, esteem the name, worship the name, adore the name, reverence the name, appreciate the name, if you do not know that name? And if you do not know what it signifies and what it stands for, the assumption is you know that name. Abraham did not know all the names of God because God was talking to Moses and he said, by the name God Almighty, by my name Jehovah, I appeared unto Abraham. But this other name he gave to Moses, the Lord said, Abraham did not know. Although Abraham had authority with heaven, Abraham knew how to pray, and Abraham knew how to talk to the Lord, and Abraham only knew a part of the name and the significance of the name of the Lord. And then when it came to Moses, Moses knew more, and you know that Moses had authority. See him standing in Egypt, and see him before Pharaoh, and see him coming in the name of the Lord, in the authority of the Lord, and binding and loosing, and declaring that this is what it will be. He knew the name of the Lord, and think of Joshua. Joshua knew the name of the Lord. And as a person that knew the name of the Lord, he was a mighty warrior. Didn't David know the name of the Lord? When he came to Goliath, what did he say? Oh, he said, you come to me with all the spear and all the sword. I come to you. How did he come to Goliath? I come to you in the name of the Lord of the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts, that means the Lord that is able to defeat any army. The Lord of hosts, whom you have defied. You better know the name of God when you pray. And when you think about the prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, these were the people that knew the name of the Lord. And then Jesus came. He had been in the bosom of God since eternity. And when he came, he spoke with the Father with a kind of nearness, with a kind of intimacy that they never saw before. In fact, I, I told you about when he came uh, to the grave of Lazarus, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, he had not even prayed yet. He had not commanded the dead to rise yet. He had not said what his request was yet. He looked up and he said, Father, I know that you hear me always. That the deal we have, the covenant we have, and I know you and I know your name, and I know every single name, not even known to the angels and not known to the children of men, not known to the prophets of the Old Testament, I know your name. I know your characteristic, I know your attribute, I know the possibilities, I know what you will do. He said, Father, I know that you hear me always. Could there be any time you will not hear me? No, there is no time. I know you hear me always. I wouldn't even have bothered to pray. I would have even said it just in my heart. You know my thoughts. You know my desire. You would have done it. But for the sake of these people that are standing here, I speak out. And then he said, Lazarus, it's enough now. Come out. That was the end. He conquered death and the grave. Oh, if you know the name of God. 
If you can only know the name of God, why don't I just give you some of the names of God? God has many names. And these names I give you to show the characteristic of God. Know that name, adore that name, understand that name, believe that name, esteem that name, adore and esteem and appreciate and believe that name. And you'll see that nothing will ever be impossible for you in Jesus' name. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 14, his name is Jehovah Jireh. That is the God that will provide. Uh, David, um, Isaac was asking the father, I said, my father, here is the wood and here is the fire. Here is everything. He says, where is the sacrifice? I said, my son, where well, you depend on God, you don't worry about anything. Sacrifice, the Lord will provide himself a lamp for the sacrifice. Did he provide? I said, did he provide? That's Jehovah Jireh, the provider. And whatever your need may be, you need salvation, you need sanctification, you need Holy Ghost baptism, you need prosperity, you need provision in your life, you need provision and, and uh, protection in your life. What is it that you need? He is Jehovah Jireh. If you know that name, allow that name, esteem that name, set that name apart from the name of your uncle from the name of any man on earth and lead that name high the name of Jehovah Jireh the provider you will see that all your needs will be provided in Exodus chapter 17 verse 15 Exodus chapter 17 verse 15 his name is Jehovah Nisi that is the Lord our banner you know what happened there Joshua had just gone to face the Amalekites it was the very first battle that Joshua would be called upon to fight. And he went to fight that battle. And here was Moses upon the mount. And here was Aaron on the one side. Or on the other side, lifting up the hand of Moses. And they overcame. And eventually, after Joshua overcame, then Moses said, Joshua, that's your first battle. That's your first victory. You know how you overcame? No, not because of me. It is because of Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. He said, young Joshua, do something. Write down a memorial. Because there will be war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. Even after I am gone, you will have a lot of battles to fight. Remember only one thing, the name of the Lord, Jehovah Nisi. If you remember that name, believe that name, depend upon that name, trust in that name, hallow that name, you will discover that you will overcome in every battle of life in Jesus' name. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 26, it is Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. You know he's the one that heals, he heals leprosy, he heals incurable diseases, because with our God, nothing shall be impossible. And if you are sick, if you're oppressed, I want to ask you, is there no balm in Gilead? There's still balm in Gilead. It says they will call upon me and I will answer them. It says they shall serve me and I will bless their water and bless their bread. And I will take sickness away from the midst of them. It said they will not cast their young. And it says, the number of your days I will fulfill is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. Know that name, pray in that name, and the Lord will answer your prayer. Whatever sickness you may find in your community, you will lay your hand on the sick and it shall recover. You will cast out devils. You will take off serpents and throw them away. And if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. You will speak with a new tongue of authority and power and faith and love. What's his name? His name is Jehovah Shalom. That's uh, Judges chapter 6 and verse 24. Jehovah Shalom means the Lord our peace. Is there any confusion, any commotion, any conflict, any problem in the world? Why don't you understand that God is the one that's able to bring calm in all the turbulence of life. And therefore, you can depend upon the Lord because it's Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. In Psalm 23, verse 1, is Jehovah Raha. Jehovah Raha means the Lord, my shepherd. You see, the sheep might face any danger, but the psalmist said, The Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Raha, and I shall not want. And if you know that the Lord is your shepherd, why are you afraid? If you see the wolf, the Lord is greater than the wolf. And the Lord will destroy the power of that wolf wanting to come against your life in Jesus' name. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, Jehovah said, Keno. Jehovah said, Keno. That is the Lord our righteousness. 
He has imparted his righteousness to us. He has imputed his righteousness to us. And we can feel confident in his righteousness because blessed is that man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are covered. And now that Christ has died for us, he has made us even his righteousness. In Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 35 is Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is present ever present. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When you go through the fire, I'll be there with you. When you go through the waters, I'll be there with you. He says, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Of whom shall I be afraid? And the Lord in the final commission he gave to his own disciples said, you go into all the world teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Then he said, lo, I am with you till the end of the world. The Lord is with you. In a time of sickness, in a time of sorrow, in a time of temptation, in a time of persecution, in a time of confusion, in a time when you say, what am I going to do? The Lord is right there. Know his name, believe his name, adore his name, esteem his name, exalt his name. And his name will work mightily in your life. Do like David that came and ran towards Goliath and said, I will not be afraid because I call. In the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is, is safe. Come into the name as a refuge today. You will find he is your father. And whatever problem you may have, he'll take everything away. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. For how long? Forever. Let the people of God say, Amen. Let's rise up and pray.